Thank you for the invitation to um, deliver this lecture. I'm very grateful to you. And um, the purpose of it is to um, provoke thought and discussion. Uh, when Jesus of Nazareth stood before Pontius Pilate, he didn't offer a referendum on what to do with him. But Pilate was moved by the will of the people in front of him um, to wash his hands. That's leadership for you. I guess Jesus might well have recalled Moses leading the captive and oppressed people out of slavery in Egypt towards freedom in the land of promise, and the people thanked him by moaning, whinging, and trying to abandon him. Well, for a Christian like me, the will of the people is not to be confused with the good of the people, or even good people. Now, who do you think said this? It's a transition about as democratically proper as the transition from Claudius to Nero. It's the arrogance. It's the contempt. That's what gets me. It's his apparent belief that he can just trample on the democratic will of the British people. It's at moments like this that I think the political world has gone mad and I am alone in detecting the, gigan the gigantic fraud. Everybody seems to have forgotten that the last general election was only two years ago. Well done. You might have thought it was a lefty aiming at whoever wins the Tory crown in what one journalist has now called the idiocracy. <laughs> well, it was Boris Johnson writing on the 21st of June 2007 of Gordon Brown. He went on to say, and I quote, they voted for Tony and yet they now get Gordon. And the transition about as democratically proper as the transition from Claudius to Nero. It's a scandal. But he doesn't leave it there. He goes on to speak of a stitcher, a palace coup, North Korean servility, a fraud and double fraud, and demands, and I quote, a mandate from the British people, a democratic mandate by asking the public to vote at once on him, on the new EU treaty, and on the implications of the devolutionary settlement. And he concluded, let's have an election without delay. Well then. <laughs> Amusing and worrying, though this is. It also raises the question I'll be looking at in this lecture. How do we know what really is the will of the people? And how are we to recognise or measure it? And how might we know that the democratic will of the people has indeed been trampled on? Now before moving on to that and taking a break for a moment from matters of hypocrisy, it's appropriate to pay tribute to the man in whose memory I speak today. One of the disappointments of my life was that when I graduated in modern languages, German and French, from the pioneering University of Bradford in 1980, it wasn't Harold Wilson, the university's chancellor, who handed over the scroll. I still regret that I missed the one opportunity I had to meet the man who created the Open University 50 years ago this year, and set up the technology universities of which Bradford was one. His 1964 to 70 governments spent more money on education than on defence, the first time in Britain's history that this was achieved, and probably the last. There were many other huge achievements, and Tony Blair wasn't exaggerating when in September 2006, unveiling a statue of Harold Wilson in Heighton, near where I grew up in, in Liverpool, he said, he brought in a whole new culture, a whole new country. He made the country very, very different. Well, 50 years is a long time in politics and the world has changed considerably. The challenges facing governments today might be different in content, but they're not so different in form. And the truth of this is to be seen in a consideration of what constitutes the will of the people. Now, Theresa May is not the only politician or commentator to repeatedly refer to the 2016 referendum result as the will of the people, and that it is the responsibility of the government to, awful word, deliver the will of the people. But doesn't she really mean the will of the majority of those who voted in the referendum? 
Does the people not include the 48% of people who voted for a different outcome? I've argued elsewhere that delivery of the referendum result in an almost equally divided country must inevitably include and involve the people who lost. Yet, the referendum was taken as a zero-sum result, demanding, as Abba put it, you might as well quote the best, the winner takes it all. <laughs> a divided will of a divided people demands compromise and consultation, both words in need of recovery. Now, Robert Saunders, writing in The New Statesman, states that Democracy is the civic religion of modern British politics, but its roots do not run deep. He goes on to survey the chequered history of various societies and polities that might have described themselves as democratic, and he observes that the picture isn't wholly positive. What we call democracy was born in Athens two and a half thousand years ago, but it involved a selective franchise. Only certain people were qualified to participate. The French Revolution of 1789 and the American Civil War of the 1860s raised other questions about democratic form and franchise, although I haven't got the time or the space to discuss them today at this point. But the point here is simply to recognise that to speak of democracy is not straightforward and the word itself is not monovalent. There are different forms of democracy. They each bring with them gains and losses, benefits and deficiencies. After all, they involve human beings, human cultures, and historico-geographical contexts, and human choices. So what about the origin of the term itself, the will of the people? Rousseau's social contract, as we know, inspired the French Revolution with its somewhat impractical notion that the only valid forms of political governance and legislation are those which completely reflect the desire of the population. When he coined the phrase, the general will, in Article 6 of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen in 1789, he was referring to its expression in law. Citizens have the right to shape it, personally or via their representatives, and all should be equal under the law subject to both its protections and punishments. Isn't it a little ironic then that even as the great humanist slogan of French revolutionary idealism, liberté, égalité, fraternité, was being proclaimed with confidence, the heads of inconvenient people were falling into bloody baskets. Rousseau saw the need for citizens to be protected from the tyrannies of majorities, and joining everyone to contribute to what Catholic social teaching refers to as the common good. Now, Rousseau wasn't without his critics, who is? And he was a creature of his time and place, who isn't? Yet the seeds of his thinking fed the imagination of people like Schumann and Adenauer, who, when creating what eventually became the European Union, saw solidarity as the glue to hold together people with competing interests and preferences in a peaceful society of mutual flourishing. Now this question of identifying the general will, the will of the people, while maintaining solidarity, of course has always been contentious. So we need first to deconstruct the term, the will of the people, and ask what is meant by it, leaving to one side for a moment its utilisation as an emotive slogan aimed at shutting down arguments. First, who are the people? Are they the sum of everyone who lives in and therefore owes a duty to the country or state and whose life is ordered by decisions of government? Or is it just those deemed mature enough to have a view on what shapes their life? If so, how is maturity to be gauged or guaranteed? Or is it the electorate as a whole? Or just those who bother to turn up at the polling station on a particular day? Or, of course, post their vote? Or is it simply the majority of those who inhabit the country? Or of the electorate? Or of those who actually vote? In the case of the United Kingdom, does it refer to an aggregate across the three nations and one province? 
Or does the particular identity of each area under devolved powers to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland command a proportionate value or weighting? I suspect you can begin to see that the question or the deconstruction of the language makes everything a little less obvious. Well, secondly, what is the will of a collective disparate populace? And how is it to be understood? Does the will of the people differ from the affection or bias or inclination or desire of the people? And does definition even matter? Now, the US Constitution of 1787 famously opens with the words, we the people. But as Albert Weil in his book, The Myth of the Will of the People, observes, the people did not draw it up. In fact, selected representatives of the states governed by the Articles of Confederation drafted it, and it was ratified in constitutional conventions made up of delegates selected by eligible electors. As Will points out, there were only 500,000 eligible electors out of a population of 4 million, and only around one-fifth of those eligible actually favoured the Constitution. Abraham Lincoln once said, I am a firm believer in the people. If given the truth, they can be depended upon to meet any national crisis. The great point is to bring them the real facts. I wonder what Lincoln would now make of fake news, Brexit or Donald Trump. Facts, even alternative ones, seem to have little power to deflect prejudice and truth seems to have become a commodity easily confused with mere opinion. Now I understand how frustrating it can be when someone takes apart the words and plays semantic games as a form of intellectual entertainment. And that's not what I want to do here. I think the issue is too serious for it to be merely a game. So let's go where we all know this is heading and look at the questions posed by the United Kingdom's current constitutional moment, um, to quote Vernon Bogdanov, or to quote me, quagmire experience, <laughs> Brexit. Let's begin with some indisputable facts. 52% of those who voted on the 23rd of June 2016 opted to leave the EU, 48% to remain, if you want the precise figures I've got. However, only 37% of the entire electorate voted to leave and 35% to remain. So the 33,577,342 who voted represent only 72.2% of the electorate and less than half of the population of the United Kingdom. As Christian List of the London School of Economics points out, this also leaves 12.9 million abstentions, 18 million UK inhabitants who were not on the electoral register for reasons of age, among others. Technically then, the referendum result might say something about the will of less than half of the UK's total population on a single issue. But they did answer the question put to them by David Cameron. And this is where I think the interesting stuff lies. The people, as defined above, answered the question put to them. The UK voted to leave the European Union. Other consequent or contingent questions were not put. But they might possibly have had an impact on how the first question was answered had they been asked. For example, what do you want to leave the European Union for? You can't just leave something and enter a vacuum. So if leaving is the will of the people, what arrangement or set of political and economic relationships do the people want to leave into? Now understandably, that question wasn't asked, as there will be, probably be a million different answers to it. In the same way as the reasons given and grievances expressed for leaving the EU, often had little or nothing to do with the EU and everything to do with Westminster, with the inevitable effect that the surgery of Brexit 
will simply not deal with the disease itself. And I know plenty of Brexiteers, particularly in Parliament, who accept that. Now, I don't intend in this lecture to address questions of lying, misrepresentation, buses, or alternative factualisation, but you may want to ask questions later. Now, part of the reason we're now in the paralysing mess of the last three years is that the consequent questions were not addressed We've now been reduced to the trading of slogans that sometimes bear little proximity to complex reality. We also find ourselves in the paralysing midst of Condorcet's paradox, and that's Nicolas de Condorcet, who was uh, writing in the 18th century, where he demonstrated that the preferences of the majority may be incoherent, even when all the underlying individual preferences are entirely coherent. Uh, whereby no combination of preferences, for example, for soft Brexit, hard Brexit, or remain, uh, on, by themselves can command an overall majority, each majority being defeated by another. I'm sure you've grasped that. Now, I agree with Christian List here that A, the will of the people is not a term that should be bandied around as if it were unequivocally clear that it represents the truth, and B, that whatever happens next, some people are suggesting another better informed, inclusive, reasoned and respectful referendum backed by citizens' assemblies, who knows? Any democratic process must pay attention to more than Brexit and look at the social and economic challenges that the Brexit vote exposed. Democracy requires more than just a mere counting of votes, as List says. Democracy must be an ongoing process and not just a one-off event every four or five years. And this brings us to the heart of the matter. What sort of a democracy is the United Kingdom? And how is the will of the people to be expressed? As um, Bob mentioned earlier, on hearing the referendum results on the 24th of June 2016, I tweeted something like the people have spoken but we don't know what they've said. And this, of course, is also the obvious response to G.K. Chesterton's oft-quoted line from The Secret People, smile at us, pay us, pass us, but do not quite forget, for we are the people of England that have never spoken yet. It's a bizarre world in which all sides on the Brexit debate claim that they have not been listened to, that the BBC is biased against them, and They've all been betrayed. If you feel you haven't been betrayed, you're in a very small minority. <laughs> there is frequently a confusion in today's political media world between two phenomena, phenomena. A, being listened to or heard, and B, being agreed with. According to the leading Brexiteers, the 2016 referendum gave voices to those who had hitherto been, or been made to be, silent. Despite Britain being characterised by its parliamentary democracy, a large number of people felt ignored by those elected to represent them. Yet the voice of protest did not have to pay attention beyond expressing grievance to the consequences and implications of that expression. Those elected to represent them in Parliament, on the other hand, were obliged, constitutionally, not only to listen to all the voices, Remainers as well as Leavers, but also to take responsibility for such inconvenient questions as how and when and what next. Swaggering rhetoric that makes the contradictory promises or despises people who know what they're talking about, I quote experts, takes no responsibility for actually making something happen. Wasn't it David Davis who said, if a democracy cannot change its mind, it ceases to be a democracy? In his excellent and illuminating book, Beyond Brexit Towards a British Constitution, Vernon Bogdanor, who I quoted earlier, expresses some evident frustration with the popular confusion between parliamentary sovereignty and national sovereignty, expressed in slogans such as take back control. Both these terms were bandied about during the referendum and have been ever since. 
and they've often been used interchangeably, as if they were synonymous, but they aren't. Briefly, national sovereignty, which begs further questions given that the United Kingdom is comprised of three nations and a province, has to do with locating the ultimate will of the people on political and legal matters in the people themselves. Now, of course, the people, once you've agreed who is to be included and excluded from this group, can agree to a variety of institutions of state or organs of governance by which this will, or consensus maybe, can be expressed and measured. A referendum is just one way to gauge the mind of the populace. In a United Kingdom comprising England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, how is the national voice to be identified when two elements of the Union vote strongly and differently from the others? I don't have time to consider this the particular challenge of the Irish border, but it does matter hugely. That's national sovereignty. Parliamentary sovereignty, on the other hand, locates this will in a particular system of representative democracy, whereby representatives of constituencies are elected to use their best wisdom for the sake of the common good of the nation, representing the views, concerns and passions of their constituents, whether those constituents voted for that person or not. In other words, the representative is not delegated to parrot a line dictated by the majority of those who elected them. And if they are deemed by the electorate after five years or so not to be as wise or helpful as originally thought, they can be replaced by someone else through the ballot box. The point is that the parliament to which they are elected represents the locus of the will of the people and a change in this will can be demanded at a general election. So these terms, national sovereignty and parliamentary sovereignty, are not synonymous. But as Bogdanor explains clearly and at length, the entry of the United Kingdom into the EEC in 1973 subjected parliamentary sovereignty to a number of innovations for which the country was not prepared. Other European countries shaped their democracy differently. To put it very simply, Parliament became subject to legal judgment in courts and legislation became subject to judgment by a court. In the UK, pre-1973, this was not possible, as in theory at least, Parliament was sovereign and had the final word in legislating for the life of the state. You have to read Bogdanor um, to get the detail and the argument, but he concludes accurately, in my view, that, for example, in relation to human rights, the process of moving from a protected to an unprotected system raises profound constitutional questions. Now, Brexiteers demanded the return of sovereignty to Parliament, perhaps recognising the changes since 1973 that saw sovereignty being shared with or transferred to bodies beyond Parliament itself, although this begs further questions, but then railed against those elected to Parliament to use their judgement for the common good of the country. Parliamentary sovereignty turned out to be a useful slogan, but an inconvenient reality when MPs did what they were actually elected to do. So what about referendums? Well, this was an innovation back in 1975, up to which time such a phenomenon was considered inimical to Britain's parliamentary sovereignty. Subsequently, they have been deemed appropriate in particular cases for identifying the mood of the electorate. However, in a parliamentary democracy such as ours, they have only ever had advisory force. So when David Cameron promised that the result of the 2016 referendum would be taken as an instruction by the government, clearly expecting a vote to remain in the EU, he was promising something the unwritten British constitution had never allowed and could not deliver without compromising the parliamentary sovereignty that allowed the referendum in the first place. As such, the game has been given away already. And this leaves us with a question. If parliamentary sovereignty is to be restored, in the language of those who believe it's been lost, 
then the use of a referendum as anything other than an advisory straw poll must be stopped. Now, I'm not advocating a way ahead at this point. I'm merely pointing out the logic of the case. Vernon Bogdanoe, in his book, Beyond Brexit, and Jonathan Powell, in a New Statesman article in February 2019, both make the case that if referendums, and you can call it referenda if you want, but I'm sticking with referendums, are to become a... I'm sure we'll spend all, all evening arguing about that now. But they both make the case that if referendums are to become a determinative feature of our democratic processes, then we need quickly to establish a set of rules to govern their use, including thresholds and status, that removes the referendum from being a tool at the disposal of the government of the day, at the whim of a prime minister, for internal party reasons. Now what is at stake here is our commonly owned and understood apprehension of democracy, of parliament and people. The cheap populist language of my constituents want, that really winds me up when I hear that, my constituents want, or the people have spoken, must be exposed for what it is and the implications for our democratic institutions and processes spelled out. And I suggest we might need some experts for this. The patronising elitism of those who reject analysis and merely shout slogans, reducing complexity to simplistic clarity, should be identified for what it is. And this goes for all those, whether on, of left or right, who wish to push argument and rationality and truth into the shadow of mere claim or assertion. I think Jeremy Corbyn has business to address here as much as Nigel Farage, Theresa May or Boris Johnson. Populism is not the preserve of left or right, as history demonstrates. The will of the people is surely easy to discern if, as Hugo Chavez maintained, I am the people. Wir sind das Volk began as a claim to freedom from the GDR and the Stasi in the run-up to 1989, but has more recently been claimed by those marching in German cities against immigrants, Islam and orderly government. The institutions of governance need to be robust and trusted, not just assumed and undermined by those who find their particular preferences not being prioritised. The will of the people should be subject to a negotiation within Parliament by those elected, not delegated, to do just that for the common flourishing of all the people of the country. Wasn't it Edmund Burke um, who, addressing the voters of Bristol and commenting on representative democracy, said, Your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment. And he betrays instead of serving you, if he sacrifices it to your opinion. As Chris Bryant MP said in 2015, Burke could be pretentious, but he wasn't always wrong. <laughs> I point you to our MPs, currently struggling with integrity and judgment, and I see it in Parliament, to square the circle of wanting to give the people what they apparently want, while at the same time believing it would be profoundly destructive to the common good and well-being of the country. Brexit and the forms it has taken in the last three years has deeply challenged our democratic norms and forms. Politicians and the media have a responsibility to be serious about the challenges and dangers this brings. And we, the people, need a forum in which we can either a reaffirm parliamentary sovereignty, parliamentary democracy and its institutional forms, or b, accept that the past has been sold incrementally by pragmatic decisions made in the last 50 years, and that we now need to recast our democracy in a different form. This latter option would mean, I suggest, moving to a codified constitution subject to legal protection, as most countries in Europe have, as opposed to our unwritten constitution and iterative uh, processes. So I would suggest this would mean moving to a codified constitution subject to legal protection, 
a more representative electoral system, some form of proportional representation, the establishment of rules for referendums, that is their status and conduct, proper and honest consideration of the consequences of devolution and devolved powers, and the physical redesign of the Palace of Westminster to reflect a changed political world which a two-party system will probably not persist. Now obviously I can't explore these in more detail here, especially devolution, the role and responsibility of the media, and the consequences of such changes. But it's clear that the genie is out of the bottle, and the United Kingdom now has a unique, if not welcomed by all, opportunity to leave behind the myths of empire, and an obsession with simplistic readings of World War II, rooted in an assumption of British exceptionalism, possibly English exceptionalism, in order to shape a new future in Europe, regardless of how Brexit and the EU develop from here, and to recover popular trust in politics by adopting new ways of examining and reforming our political institutions and processes. The constant undermining of these by politicians and media make this task urgent. It could also be energising and creative. Now, in conclusion, we need to recognise first that populism is not new, as we saw earlier. Secondly, majorities cannot claim the right to be right. They are simply a majority view. A huge majority might vote for a party that decides elimination of Jews is acceptable or even expedient. <coughs> Morality cannot be determined by majority votes. Thirdly, Brexit has been debated almost exclusively in terms of trade and economics. But the economy is a means to an end, which is people, society and the common good. Uh, when the statement by David Davis was read in the House of Lords um, ahead of the triggering of Article 50, I'd read the statement before we went into the debate and the final paragraph um, explained Brexit in terms of three categories. They were all economic. And so I got up and I asked a question about for whom the economy exists, or is the economy actually an end in itself? And therefore, whatever we do in terms of Brexit or constitutional change is all about money. And I got fairly short shrift from the minister, but when I bumped into him half an hour later, as he was leaving the Lords, he said to me, Nick, why don't we see these things until someone points them out? Fourthly and finally, we need to discover, create and willfully propagate a form of public discourse that is honest, realistic and respectful, without which the rest of my proposals are unlikely to hold and democratic integrity will always be suspect. The will of the people might be more complicated to discern, but underlying it is a question about the good of the people. And that's for another lecture, another day. Thank you. When you talk about voting and say, well, it's not the will of the people, only 20% voting. I believe that everybody should have to vote. And what, what's your opinion about well, that? In some countries, it's compulsory. Um, Australia has it compulsory. That if you're a citizen, you not only have the protections and benefits of the state, but you have a duty towards it as well. And you can never say, well, you know, other people are responsible for the mess. Um, I did a lot of work, as was hinted earlier, on the Soviet Union and uh, Eastern Europe, where voting was compulsory. Um, and that wasn't as desirable. Um, so having, making it compulsory doesn't end the argument of how you then exercise that. I remember when I was at university um, studying 
I was doing German and French, but majoring on politics, and coming across uh, an election result in Corsica where there was 119% turnout. <laughs> <laughs> no systems for that. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that there was a gentleman a couple of rows up. Um, and then we have, yeah, we've got the two on this side, and then we'll jump to the back. My, my question resolves around my, my late father. If I can hear that, okay? Keep going. Yeah. yeah. Well, my late father fought in the Second World War. He said, never, ever again. My fear is that we're slowly, we're slowly into something that we never, ever contemplated when people first used to come out with the EU. That may sound very dramatic. I'm, I'm a great fan of the Civil Program, how I got news from you. And recently there was a question about civil war. And I think Paul Merton said, Well, this, what, what you learn in politics isn't, or in history is never say never. I mean, I know people in, I was in Novi Sad in Serbia last year, where um, I met people just, actually just a year ago, it was July, where I met people who couldn't believe what happened in the Balkans. They thought concentration camps belonged to the Nazis. They thought that civil war based on race and ethnicity was a thing of the past. And look what happened. Um, civilization, I think, is, is fairly, it's a thin veneer. It's very fragile. And it doesn't take a lot to rip it off. And I think part of, if I'm being very frank, I think part of the problem that we have in Britain, I alluded to it, British or English exceptionalism. You know, two world wars and one world cup, na 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 na, every time I play Germany, football. It's pathetic when you look at it from outside. And, you know, whereas in Germany, um, in 1945, everything was destroyed, everything, you had to start again, new institutions. You had to face your history. We've never had to do that. And I, that's what I meant by the end of, em the, the, end of the myth of empire. I, you know, I think Brexit, whatever happens, might actually be the trigger for the ending of this sort of stupid hubris Britannia still rules the waves. We've got to grow up and face reality. Um, but what that process will involve, obviously, is fairly dangerous. I mean, the other side of it is that we've spent the last 30, there a lot of people, the last 30 or 40 years, people, particularly people on the left, haranguing the United States for being the policeman of the world. And now you've got Trump saying, well, it's America first, we've got 800 military bases, and we're running a massive deficit, let's pull out. Now the same people are going, well, oh, you can't pull out, that's isolationist and protectionist and all of this. <coughs> you can't have it both ways. You know, history will be interesting when they read it back in the next 50 years. Um, I think you might have alluded to it, um, Bishop Nick, when you talked about your own um, to do with Dave, meeting David Davis, who's really in Parliament, but um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about This is a challenge. I mean, in the, you know, in the House of Lords, um, in the last three years, um, people on all sides, from all persuasions in relation to Brexit, have sidled up to me and probably other bishops and said, you lot are going to have to get us out of this because we can't. And they're not joking. And I, I, whenever anyone says anything nice about the church, I assume they're being sarcastic <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're not and they don't know how to do it and this is why the um, deliberate I think um, destruction of trust in the institutions and in our democracy by throwing around things like parliamentary sovereignty until it becomes inconvenient to those who use the phrase um, when you look at what's happened with the leaking of um, of uh, emails from our ambassador in Washington. I mean, this is the corruption, the deliberate um, disintegration of trust in the institutions we have. 
Now either we replace the institutions, we've got, we've got to have a way of creating a new discourse rooted in a new narrative. And it can't be a narrative that is simply rooted in we won the war and therefore everything's going to be okay. So I, I think we've got some challenges and the church, I, I can't say too much, um, well anything really, about <laughs> the sort of conversations we're involved in, but you could see in the next few weeks some developments where the church will be at the heart of holding together new conversations. Gentlemen in the middle of the back. <coughs> I have got two mics going around, right? Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the, for the talk. Um, I heard you uh, dissect the idea of this, um, uh, the will of the people, but I, I didn't hear you say you, you reject it entirely. Wouldn't it be simpler to simply say this is a bogus notion, and when somebody uses this turn of phrase, uh, you know, an alarm bell should go off, and we should say, uh, you know, we need to question what this person is saying and challenge it because it's not a, it's not a helpful idea. Well, I, I think actually most of what I said, particularly early on, was exactly challenging that notion. I mean, we we need to be sceptical of the language people use. Now, to, is it not coincidental that take back control didn't mean, or doesn't apparently mean now, what we were told it meant three years ago? Uh, who was taking back control? Particularly when we never lost control. So, for example, over immigration, um, the government had the right to stop the <laughs> Eastern Europeans coming in. They didn't exercise the rights that they had. And this is why, you know, this is why I said um, at some point in the, the lecture, um, getting out of the EU will not solve the problems because they are not fundamentally to do with the EU. Some problems will get worse. I mean, look at Swindon. Um, Honda, rightly or wrongly, I think probably wrongly, they advised people, you know, their employees and so on, to vote Remain. Um, they voted heavily to leave. <laughs> then Honda announced they were shutting the plant. And everyone went on a march saying, you can't. Now, there's something here about being grown-ups. You know, if you're a grown-up, an adult, you recognise that you have to, t that, um, that voting or uh, expressing an opinion, making a choice, brings consequences. My argument in Parliament has not been um, necessarily we shouldn't leave the EU, but I have said to the Minister repeatedly, will you please be honest and tell us what the costs are going to be? Don't tell us it's all going to be rosy, the sunlit uplands. Because you might say to us, um, you know, for the next 15 years, we're going to have huge unemployment, we're going to be a pariah on the edge of Europe, we're going to lose 20% um, of the financial um, clout in London, which is already going abroad, 10% is already gone. Um, it's, it's going to really hurt us, but the prize is worth it after 15 years. We might have voted for it if we believed the prize was worth it. But we weren't, and we're not told that. We're constantly given slogans that tell us it'll all be marvellous. And if you ask any question, or you question the will of the people, you're simply trying to stop Brexit. It's pathetic. So I, I'm totally with you. Question the language all the time. I voted to leave. Mm -hmm. um, the following morning when I woke up, I expected we would have remained. Uh, and I was shocked that mm -hmm. we voted to leave. Now, all this nonsense was happened ever since. What do you think would have happened if we actually had have voted to stay? There wouldn't have been any of this kind of... The Brexiteers wouldn't have been going up the wall and sort of committing so virtually, you know, attacking everyone. In fact, like the, the, the mourners and the, and the Ramonas and things, you know. I mean, what, what's your thoughts on that if it had gone the other way around? Nigel Farage... It would be just it. Yeah, Nigel Farage actually said it's on record 
that before, I mean a day or two before the referendum itself, he said, uh, if it's say 52-48 to remain, then this is not over by any means at all. So actually they would have carried on. Um, they would have carried on. And, and that's what a democracy is. You know, what's been shocking about our process, and I think it's the reason for the paralysis, is that it's what I call a zero-sum game, winner takes all. If you've got a divided country, basically 50-50, if you're going to get anything to go, go through Parliament, if you're going to get um, a consensus for building a future, then you're going to have to bring some of the people who didn't get their way over. And you don't do that by saying, we're not listening to you, you're out, you lost, just get over it, get on with it, and we're just going to apply ourselves to these people. So politically and pr pragmatically, it was very badly handled by treating it as a zero-sum game. And that has nothing to do whether it was right or wrong to vote the way we did. Thank you. I'm 45 years old. You don't look it. <laughs> and every time I watch the people in the House of Commons, I find them childish. So I'm actually, and their behaviour, I find them childish. And these are grown-ups that are basically voting for me and my children's future and everybody else's living. I just want to find out what you think about the actual grown-ups doing this. And is there any way that we can get young people in there to actually have a more balanced people in the House of Commons? Because these are all people that are very over age. I'm not saying over age, but in ages, but do you know what I mean? There's not a balance there. Thank I do not see anybody really there that resembles my age or well, me. Have you been down to the House of Commons? No, I've not been back. Right. Well, you, you should come down sometime. Um, I'll take you for lunch in the House of Lords. <laughs> um, but if you go and see, if you go down to it, this is part of the, the problem we have with our perception. Most of what you see about Parliament is question time and people shouting and screaming across e at each other. Um, if you go down any other time, what you find is sometimes the same people who are doing that engaged in really intelligent, respectful, articulate debate. Um, telling stories, um, doing good analysis, informed analysis, but that, that isn't good telly. So, you know, I mean, there, frankly, there are people in the Commons and in the Lords who shouldn't be there, more so in the Lords, probably. <laughs> and we can talk about, if, if you want to talk about House of Lords, we can. Um, so there was a peer recently um, made a snide comment about, you know, you lot shouldn't even be here speaking to bishops. I said, look, if it gets on to, um, you know, how we got in here, I wouldn't push too hard on that, mate. Lord, <laughs> so, it was a hereditary peer. Um, no, but, but I, come down and see it. If you hit the right day, you can get some really good stuff. And I quite often, um, when I'm on duty in the Lords, um, because the common starts in the morning, we often start in the afternoon, can't sleep longer. Um, I'll go in just to listen. And we have some remarkable MPs. I mean, the people I know best, just because they respond to stuff, are people like Rachel Reeves, Mary Cray, Yvette Cooper, um, Hilary Benn, people like that. You know, I know the agonies they are going through. Um, I had a meeting with Luciana Berger from Liverpool, who is now has left the Labour Party. Do you know she's not allowed to use public transport anymore? She has to use taxis because of threats to her life, even when she was eight months pregnant. You know, something's gone wrong, but, the, but don't denigrate all MPs because some of them are mad. <coughs> Uh, we say we must listen to the other side and bring, the, bring them over. You seem to be advocating compromise. Now, uh, the Via Media may have worked for the Church of England and worked very well, but surely in this Brexit case, compromise would leave, leave us with the worst of both worlds, that we would leave the European Union 
you to obey all the rules without having any say in them. Surely compromise is totally inappropriate here and we should revoke Article 50. Well, that's one clear solution. Um, if you want clear solutions, we leave with no deal. But don't believe all this stuff about GATT 24. I've got a copy of it at home. Um, and breezy assertion, was it Boris Johnson said yesterday? I was at the General Synod, so I needed some light relief. <laughs> he, said, um, he said something like, um, we need ambition, energy, and confidence or something. And I think I, tw I saw it on Twitter. And I tweeted, you know, and, and fairy dust. <laughs> or maybe experts. You know, girding up your loins and believing harder. Believe in Britain. When, when does that achieve anything? This is about structure and mechanisms. That's why we're in the impasse. Because we now, for the first time in our history, I bet you it's the first time in our history, we have a government whose express policy it is to make the country poorer. Because um, even the Brexiteers, even Theresa May, Forrest, but they all know that we will be poorer. That is the certain outcome of whatever form of Brexit. We will be poorer. And not just economically. Um, now, this is where I go back to what I said earlier. If we were told, but the prize in 15 years, once we've you know, negotiated and worked out, might be, you know, we'd be better then we might have bought it, but don't tell us, just gird up your loins and believe. So compromise, compromise is going to have to happen because that's how life and politics work. <coughs> if we go out with no deal, pity help us, because actually there is no such thing as no deal in terms of you know, going out into a structure. Um, if we go out um, with a deal, it will involve a degree of compromise. I said I wasn't going to talk about the Irish border. I'm in touch with, I mean, I'm in regular touch with a bishop whose diocese straddles the border. Don't listen to Johnson and Hunt and people like that on the Irish border. Listen to the Irish. And they are very, very, very worried. Not about the economics, but about the societal and psychological triggers back towards sectarianism and violence. You know, you only have to go into the um, other EU countries to see that whereas we were respected around the world for our pragmatism um, um, we're being laughed at um, there was a time I had a meeting in uh, 2015 I did a two hour gig in Stuttgart with Kofi Annan and the German foreign minister Ankbar Steinmeier who is now the German president and this was ahead of uh, a referendum and he said Steinmeier um, said to me um, why are you even thinking of this and I said well I'm not <laughs> but, but we are and if we have a referendum we could vote to leave now he couldn't understand that from a German perspective but I can tell you in the last couple of years that question has changed from how can you possibly be doing this into how can you possibly be so incompetent? And that's the embarrassment. But we've got to find a way through this that creates a new narrative for our country. We're still in Europe, even if we're out of the EU. You did a, a very nice job of a, a two-part critique of the democratic system. That one is constitutional and institutional, and the other is about public discourse mm -hmm. uh, being harsh, ill-informed, I suppose my slight concern was you, you might be more optimistic than I am about co constitutional change to change uh, the sort of public discourse. And I just wondered if you'd say a few more words about how we might go about making public discourse more fact-based, less histrionic, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'm not optimistic about constitutional change. What I was trying to set out was not my view of what ought to happen. Uh, the genius of um, the British unwritten constitution is that um, it, it develops, it's iterative. Um, I try to explain, some of you may remember Rowan Williams did a, um, a lecture on Sharia law and got into a bit of trouble. 
And I had to go out to Germany and explain to the head of the German church, it was uh, apoplectic about it, um, that Rome was actually asking a question, not making a statement. But I realised in, in the course of conversations that in Germany you have a basic law, a written constitution. So when they talk about the neutrality of the public square, you know what they mean. Everybody is subject to it, it doesn't matter who you are. And I said, well, we don't have that. We have what I would describe as a negotiation based on precedent. Now, that's what we have a choice, I think. If we're going to have referendums and things like that, then we have to accept we're in a different world. If um, what Parliament decrees is going to be subject to courts and to law, then that is a different polity. Now, I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. We've got to be honest and clear about the game we're playing. It's no good playing netball on a football pitch. That's the point. And thinking you're playing badminton while you're doing it. And that's the, where we are at the moment. And I, I could go on at length about why I think, how I think we got there. Um, but the public discourse is, is much more difficult because the only, the only way to supplant bad news is to tell good news. And I think the only way to contradict um, the really poor discourse, you know, ruled by assertion and opinion and shouting rather than fact, reality and analysis that may prove me wrong, you know. Um, the only way to, to change that, I think, to contradict the poor discourse is to only use good discourse. That's the only way you can do it. I've said that in a speech in the House of Lords. Um, it has to start here. We have to model how you can have a respectful conversation about deeply dividing stuff. Um, we should be able to do it. But you have to pay attention to language. And as you know, we are the worst linguists in the world. I'm serious. It's a really serious issue. He is in das Volk. And that was twisted subsequently to Biz in Hong Kong. We are one people. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, along with other pieces like the Crime and the Soviet Union, gradually that led to um, the wall coming down, which was a very seismic change for Germany, mm -hmm. very traumatic. But gradually they came through it. Two, two things. I mean, Germany isn't out of it. No. You know, there are major problems because it was a takeover of the West, by, of the East by the West, rather than reunification, as Jonathan knows as well, because he now chairs a commission that I chaired for eleven years. Um, the experience in the East, despite getting billions of euros to reconstruct it, um, is still alienation, and, and the far right more resurgent in the former East than in the West. Um, but yeah, I, I can be optimistic because um, I've got a book coming out in August <laughs> <laughs> called Freedom is Coming. It's, um, but it's based on Isaiah 40 to 55, which is addressed to a people who are in exile and have been for many generations. And it's saying to them, your, your time of exile is coming to an end, you're going home. Now most people, when they hear that, they think, well this is, I mean you'll know it from Handel's Messiah, comfort, comfort my people, says your God, Isaiah 40. But actually going home was very, very complicated because some people hadn't gone into exile and they've got a bunch of immigrants coming back to join them who they don't know but have kept alive a memory of home that they fossilised and romanticised while they were in exile. And they're going to have to get on with each other and make it happen. Some people have been born in exile, so that is home. So what does it mean to go back to somewhere else that was never home? You know, it's actually very complicated. And we know that real human societies are complex and that history takes time. 
a long time. But I also believe, and I, I'm a bit Hegelian in this, that, um, that you do get through things. You know, who'd have thought um, Germany in 1945, uh, within 50 years, would be as strong as it was? And because it was utterly destroyed, had no structures, no governments, no, no culture. You know, the psychology was destroyed. And yet, look at them. But it doesn't happen by accident. And if you want to shape the future and shape the sort of culture um, that we want our children and I want my grandchildren to grow up in, then I have to be stuck in doing what we said earlier, modelling a different way of speaking. Whatever happens, if we go into a sort of exile, um, as a Christian, learning from Isaiah, I would say we keep alive the songs of home while we're in exile. And we don't give up and we don't collude in the naysayers and the mess. So I'm optimistic that the, fu the future will come. That sounds a stupid thing to say and an obvious thing. But the future now is not the ultimate. But I think there are going to be big shifts in the world. Watch China. Mm -hmm. <laughs>